Um, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Valerie Plumpus, and I'm Equality California's National Policy Director. Um, thanks to the generous support of the AT&T Foundation and Semper Energy, Equality California is able to help the LGBTQ community respond to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, if you haven't already done so, I, I urge you to go to see our website. It is COVID-19 at eqca.org. And then you'll find a link of a whole range of services that are provided at the federal and the state and the local level. So if you have any needs, you can uh, research uh, what uh, you know, our, our, our programs and, and ways to get help. Um, Equality California has been uh, hosting a number of webinars. This is one of them. We're trying to help LGBTQ people navigate the economic disparities and, uh, and crises with regard to um, the COVID crisis. Today is our third webinar in this COVID crisis. Uh, our topic today is guarding against eviction during the COVID crisis. This is obviously a critical area of discussion given that somewhere between 30 and 40 million people have lost their jobs, they've been furloughed, they've lost income from their side gigs, um, other in, econ, uh, economic uh, income generating opportunities, maybe they can't pay their rent anymore. So we thought we would talk today about eviction. Um, and so I'll be introducing our speaker in just a few minutes. If you're looking at your screen, you'll see a poll question. If you could answer it, we'll be sharing the responses um, later in the program. One of the other things that we've done is we've established a telephone helpline. People can use it, they can raise questions about their personal circumstances, and they'll get a call back from some of on our staff. Some of the calls we've gotten have uh, been about hostile or unsympathetic uh, landlords who have been demanding full rent payments or locking people out and the like. And so that's why we're so happy to be joined today by our guest speaker. This is Joshua Christian. He's a senior counsel of the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. As always, all of our webinars are being recorded and they'll remain accessible. I'll be putting links to some resources in the Q&A box. These won't be visible to the other uh, speakers um, on our Zoom platform. And if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the little Q&A box and you can put whatever questions you want and Joshua would be happy to answer them. Uh, after today's webinar, as always, Equality California is gonna be sending out the links to Joshua's slides and then all the resources that we hope that you find will find very helpful. So Joshua, I'd like to welcome you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Really happy to have you. Hi, Valerie, thanks. I'm happy to be here. Well, we're delighted. So not everyone might be familiar with what a Legal Aid Foundation does. Can you tell us what it is and, and the kinds of work that you do? Yes, absolutely. So I'll run through at the very beginning of uh, the presentation what exactly the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles uh, does and our locations in case anybody in, in LA County needs to access our services. But uh, in general, a, a legal services organization, usually that term means that we're affiliated with the Legal Services Corporation, uh, which is a funder of, of services, legal services for low-income individuals that largely comes from the federal government, although we work with a number of different grants as well. Uh, we specifically provide services to the low-income and vulnerable populations who are not able to otherwise access services for one reason or another. Uh, our services are all entirely free. We provide specifically civil legal services, uh, which means that we don't do criminal defense, uh, but we do do a number of different areas, immigration law, advocacy. Um, we work on reentry. And again, I'll show you a big list of our work groups uh, a few slides in, uh, at least at the Legal Aid Foundation. I will say also, um, there are a number in LA County and elsewhere, there are a number of other nonprofit legal firms that provide services. Not everyone is affiliated with the Legal Services Corporation. Uh, other folks operate on, on different grants, but in terms of the Legal Aid Foundation and most legal services firms, that's our, our story. Oh, that's fantastic, thanks so much. If you're just joining us now, we have our third webinar series in the Equality California's COVID-19 series. This one is on eviction. Our speaker today is uh, Joshua Christian. He is the senior counsel at the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. Valerie, I'm going to jump in. I'm so sorry. I'm a staff attorney. I'm just going to correct your uh, job. Oh, I'm so sorry. Staff no, attorney. That's right. That's all right. Thank Give me you. a few well, weeks, hopefully. <laughs> well, we appreciate your expertise, and I understand that you're going to start uh, sharing your slides with us so you can walk us through evictions and, and the kinds of protections that uh, LGBTQ people and, and others in the state of California might avail themselves. Of course. Okay, so hi everybody. As Valerie mentioned, my name is Joshua Christian. Uh, I am a staff attorney with the Eviction Defense Center at the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. 
Uh, I am going to go over today just a few different topics primarily. Um, I'm going to try to uh, hit very quickly state level California protections coming out of the governor's office. I'm going to run through federal protections through the CARES Act briefly. Um, I'm then going to talk about uh, more procedural protections against eviction that have been put in place by the California Judicial Council. And then I'll be touching upon various local rules that have been put in place. Now, those local jurisdictional rules, and I'll talk about this more, are going to change in every single local jurisdiction. So what I'll do is I'll touch on the ordinances that are in place in Los Angeles County, Los Angeles City, and kind of do some, some comparison to show you what the basic elements of one of these ordinances tends to be so that you can look into your individual local ordinance and find out what all these elements are for you. Uh, so let me just start by uh, going over the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles and our basic makeup. We've been around since 1929, uh, providing services to low-income individuals all over uh, LA County. We have five offices here in various neighborhoods. Uh, we run domestic violence clinics in several locations uh, and self-help legal access centers in several courthouses. Uh, we also run a, a legal hotline that's going from uh, Monday through Friday in the mornings, 9 to 12. Uh, if you call in and you qualify for services, you can be provided housing advice, um, or if for some reason you do not qualify, we refer you to someplace else to get advice as well. Um, so uh, I was going to run over just some issues that we deal with. We only deal with civil legal rather than criminal legal issues. Uh, but we focus on a lot of different subject areas and we have work groups that target specific populations. So domestic violence and family law, employment, of course, eviction defense and other ho housing and homelessness issues. Uh, we also have units that focus on issues that, that are related to the Asian and Pacific Islander community, uh, to homeless individuals, to veterans. You can see the list here, but you know, we have, we have these work groups that are all specializing in different areas. Okay. So that's the foundation. Uh, now I'm going to get into the, the substance here. I'm going to start primarily, as I mentioned, with things that are going on at the state level uh, through the governor's orders and then the Federal CARES Act. Uh, the governor's executive orders began in March, the, the executive orders related to eviction. And of course, there's been a cascade related to all sorts of different issues. Uh, his initial order was issued in March 16th. Uh, it was extended March 27th. And actually, just two days ago, the government issued, uh, or sorry, the governor issued an executive order that extended that March 27th order all the way through September 30th. Uh, so this is all based around that March 27th order and 3720, but it's now been extended all the way through September 30th. Now, what that order does is that it extends your deadline to respond to an eviction by 60 days. And now I'm going to just throw out a clarification. You might see the term unlawful detainer, or you might hear me say it throughout the presentation. I'm going to try to say eviction as much as possible, but unlawful detainer is just the legal jargon term for eviction. So being a litigator, I fall into jargon sometimes, but I will try to avoid, avoid doing that. Um, UD stands for unlawful detainer. So the, the deadline to respond to an unlawful detainer that has been filed is extended for 60 days. And that's assuming that the non-payment has been related to, uh, that it's a non-payment eviction, not an eviction based on, for instance, illegal activity or some other breach of your lease, that the landlord has been notified and that the non-payment is related to, to the coronavirus pandemic. Now, the reason I hit this very quickly is quite simple. The governor's executive order is probably not going to be the most important thing to you in your jurisdiction. The other primary element of the executive order is basically that the governor said state laws that conflict with local jurisdictions are now no longer going to conflict. I am going to say that where state law would preempt certain elements of eviction procedure, local jurisdictions now have the power to enact these protections. So what the governor really did was kind of uh, enact a bit of a floor and just open up the arena for local jurisdictions to pass their own individualized protections. Uh, in addition to that, the Judicial Council has established certain changes to rules that will apply and prevent eviction proceedings from being filed that don't fully supersede, supersede the governor's executive order, but uh, do make it a little bit less relevant, to be frank. 
Okay, so now let me move on to the CARES Act, to federal protections. Uh, it, it, the CARES Act was signed by the president at the end of March. Uh, it provides protections both, both for homeowners and for tenants. Uh, the CARES Act requires some kind of nexus with federal funding of some kind, essentially. So a homeowner, a, a tenant that is protected by the CARES Act needs to be the tenant of a homeowner who has a federally backed mortgage or the tenant needs to be the recipient of some kind of federal housing subsidy, which in, in my area of practice is more often what we deal with. Uh, so I'm gonna run through these uh, a little bit faster because they are also somewhat limited in their applicability. Uh, and also the judicial council and local jurisdictions will have displaced them somewhat. Filing of evictions during the moratorium period that expires in, in, uh, toward the end of July uh, has been suspended. After that moratorium period, a landlord can only evict after serving 30 extra days notice before filing, uh, and late fees can't be charged during this period. Uh, there will be Spanish, I'm not gonna go through the Spanish slides individually because I'm not a Spanish speaker, but these have largely been translated and they'll be available uh, through Equality California. Uh, the other type of uh, property or tenancy where the federal moratorium is gonna apply is going to be federal subsidies. Uh, the most common federal subsidies are going to be public-based housing uh, and the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program, uh, also low-income housing tax credit properties, basically uh, uh, tenancies where the tenant's rent is subsidized in some way through a federal government program. These protections are going to come into play. Now, I'm going to set those aside for just a moment, uh, and I am going to move on to Judicial Council rules. So as I said, the two uh, largest protections for tenants right now in the state of California are gonna be the State Judicial Council suspension of evictions, which are procedural largely, but powerful also. Uh, and in addition to that, whatever your local jurisdiction may have passed. Um, so starting with the State Judicial Council rules, the State Judicial Council has decided and issued rules themselves that say that new summonses for eviction cases cannot be issued until 90 days after the state of emergency ends in California. Valerie, did I see your hand? Joshua, can I, if I just interrupt you for a second, for those of us who are not lawyers, can you explain what a summons is? I will, I'm, I'll be right there. The, <laughs> that's where I'm going next. The, uh, so a summons is essentially the document that actually hauls you into court. It's essentially the operative part of an eviction filing. A summons is what a landlord has to serve you with in order to bring you into court. So right now, a landlord could issue you a three-day notice on their own, a piece of paper that they put on your front door. But if that three-day notice expires and they decide they're going to try to actually sue you to take you into court for eviction, the court is not going to issue a summons for them until 90 days after the emergency ends. In addition to that, what's ordinarily going to happen in an eviction lawsuit or in any lawsuit is that once you are served with that summons, you have a particular period of time where you have to file your answer in court or your landlord can win by default. Your landlord can request what's called a default judgment. This same rule is in effect for default judgments. And so if you were served with, uh, with an unlawful detainer with an eviction prior to this moratorium going into place, but your landlord hadn't requested a default judgment against you, that means that the, the courts are not going to process a default judgment. They are not going to default you until at least 90 days after the state of emergency ends. So in effect, the timeline to answer an eviction that has already been filed has also been suspended. The rule also says that trial dates are going to be continued if they were already scheduled for at least 60 days. And what we're seeing now is that courts around the state are continually moving trials back because for public safety reasons uh, are largely because of local jurisdictional changes. Now, let me get to that back, that, that very final bullet point there, which is very important. There is an exception to these rules. And that exception is that if a landlord can prove to the court that there is a threat to public health and safety posed by a breach of a lease, then they can move forward with a summons. So landlords in cases where they are alleging illegal activity, nuisance, 
uh, a, a situation where someone poses a threat to another tenant, for instance, is harassing someone violently, they may petition the court to issue a summons in that case. And we have seen landlords doing that. They do go into court on a, an emergency basis and file a petition and say, there is a public health and safety threat, please issue a summons in this case. Now, what's going to happen then is not you will immediately be evicted, and I'll go over the eviction process a little bit more in a moment, but what that means is that a summons is going to be issued and you will be served with an eviction. So I don't want people to be uh, left with the impression that if they are served with a court summons, they don't have to answer it. The court could allow a summons to be issued, and in that case, you would have to answer, and you should contact a legal services organization, should contact an attorney to assist you, or you can do it on your own uh, if you feel like you can navigate the proper court forms. Um, so uh, uh, again, I will say, if you are served with a summons, you should answer it. That said, uh, you know, a landlord trying to go into court and argue, well, I, I'm trying to evict the tenant because they didn't pay their rent, but there's a huge public safety issue. I'm trying to evict the tenant because they have a dog. Oh, but there's a huge public safety issue. Courts are going to look on that with a little bit of skepticism, because if there's a huge public health and safety issue, why wasn't that raised in the first place? Uh, so that is the State Judicial Council rules. Now, let me move on to the eviction moratoriums uh, in individual jurisdictions. So this is specific to LA County, but, but many jurisdictions in the state have passed some kind of eviction moratorium within their borders. Now, the, the scope of those eviction moratoriums varies widely, uh, and it, but each one of those moratoriums is going to share certain basic elements. Now, there might be extraneous pieces, there might be anti-harassment provisions, but primarily I'm going to go through the LA County moratorium, the LA City moratorium, and then I'm going to hit on the, uh, I'll actually touch on the Long Beach moratorium just as kind of a, a contrast a little bit. Uh, just to give you an impression of what the basic elements are. And then understanding that there are people viewing the webinar who aren't necessarily tenants in LA County, in LA City, in, uh, in, in Long Beach, which is our other example. You should go and check out what your local jurisdiction has enacted. Most of these basic elements are, are gonna be in place, but each one could be a little bit different. And you want to make sure that you look up online, that you contact your local housing department, whatever it happens to be, to make sure that you know how to protect yourself in your individual jurisdiction. So most cities have stopped evictions for non-payment due to coronavirus. That is, mo most jurisdictions have done that. Uh, some have stopped evictions for other reasons. They've also said you can't evict based on nuisance. You can't evict uh, for, you can't serve 60 day, 30 day, what are called no fault notices to evict someone. Uh, in addition to that, some include commercial tenancies, some only include residential tenancies. Most have suspended late fees during this period as well, but you know, you should check. Uh, the governor's order also deals with that. In addition to that, uh, you should keep in mind that these, cities and jurisdictions in general are not suspending the obligation to pay rent, or rather they're, they're not completely waiving the obligation to pay rent. Most are going to be uh, enacting some kind of scheme where a tenant has 12 months, six months, however many months to pay that back rent or then face eviction. So a city will generally have a moratorium. When that moratorium terminates, you will then have a certain period of time to essentially catch up on the balance that accrued during this period of time. And during that repayment period, rent is going to be due like usual. So there are going to be ten tenants that are scrambling uh, to try to pay back this balance, and, and it's going to be a difficult time for everyone. There are some bills at the state level that are examining this, this issue for sure, uh, and you should look into that if you're curious. Uh, but in general, that, that has been the framework. So. Oh dear. Oh geez. Ha. Um, so LA County, let's just go through a couple of examples. Uh, first of all, uh, the ordinance in LA County is effective in unincorporated areas of LA County or places where cities haven't enacted their own protections. So 
Similarly, there's an ordinance in place in Alameda County, and you should check out where exactly is that applicable? Is it applicable in only in unincorporated areas? Is it applicable if my individual city has not enacted an eviction protection? Uh, is it applicable as a floor? Is it applicable to protect me as a, a protection that applies regardless of whether or not my individual city has passed something? And this is something that you need to look into and research in your individual jurisdiction. Uh, in LA County, the, the time frame for these moratoriums will change in each individual jurisdiction. Um, I'll hit LA City in a moment, but LA County has chosen to reevaluate and extend its eviction moratorium on a month by month basis. Evictions in LA County are banned for no fault. There can be no 30 day, 60 day, hey, you just need to leave, the landlord terminated your tenancy. Those are not allowed in LA County. A tenant in LA County can self certify to their landlord that they are unable to pay due to coronavirus. That means they don't need special evidence from a third party. They can simply say, hey, I will certify to you that I am unable to pay my, uh, my rent due to coronavirus. Um, also, LA County protects against nuisance related to coronavirus. The idea here is that if someone needs to be staying in your home for purposes of quarantine, your landlord can't come around and then try to evict you on the basis of an unauthorized occupant. But that protection doesn't exist in a lot of jurisdictions. A lot of jurisdictions are only protecting for uh, for non-payment evictions. In LA County, 12 months to repay rent that's accrued. Um, and in LA County, and this is important, there is a ban on harassment or intimidation on the basis of the coronavirus here. Um, so let me move on to LA City just to compare. Uh, LA City is similar to LA County, but that protection is effective through the end of the local emergency. There is no extending month by month until the local LA County state of emergency ends, there will be protections in place. Um, in addition, there are no fault evictions and no fault evictions under the Ellis Act under LA rent stabilization. I'm not gonna go into the individual bits and pieces of LA rent stabilization. All I wanna call your attention to is that that's a specific provision to LA City. So keep in mind what's in place for your city individually. Late fees have been banned, 12 months to pay the back rent and that's you know, the same as LA County, but LA City has a special anti-harassment provision in their ordinance. A landlord who harasses someone specifically because they have not paid rent due to coronavirus can be liable for up to $10,000 in damages for each instance of harassment. So that's a powerful thing. And of course, our firm is dealing a lot with that issue and, and we have that leverage to say to a landlord on behalf of a client, you could be accruing a whole lot of damages if you decide that you're going to try to illegally lock them out, uh, hassle them day and night, pound on the door. That could cost you quite a lot of money. That protection is available in, in the city of LA. It's available in the county of LA, and it's not available in Long Beach. So you can see there are these changes from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And I, I, I'll skip past Long Beach for now, but understand that it's just a little bit of a weaker protection. No fault eviction notices are not banned. Right now it's effective through July 31st, but it might, it might expire then. Um, you also need to actually have documentation to provide to your landlord, and the law doesn't establish exactly what that documentation is. So you should assemble whatever you can and perhaps consult with an attorney to figure out whether it's sufficient, right? And of course, work with your landlord to try to come up with the, the proper documentation that they'll accept. So my theme here all the way through, these slides will be posted if they're relevant, if you're in LA City, LA County, uh, Long Beach, but in individual jurisdictions that I'm not mentioning here, uh, you need to figure out what law applies in your jurisdiction. If you're in an unincorporated area or an incorporated city, which law applies? Is there a separate jurisdiction or an ordinance for you? Are there no fault notices? Are there nuisance related notices? What's the situation with rent increases? Uh, are they permitted? Um, do you, if you cannot uh, pay rent due to coronavirus, do you need to provide a notice to your landlord? You do in, in, you do in Los Angeles County, but not in Los Angeles City, and there's often a timeline. Long Beach demands written notices, but it's on a different county, a different timeline from LA County. These change from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Do you need documentation? And then, 
the most important thing, and this is in any legal dispute, this is every tenant that I give advice to, protect yourself by keeping records and contact someone for legal assistance if you need it. But the most important thing is just keep your documents, keep your records of any fallen income, uh, and try to keep your communications with your landlord if you're in a dispute in writing uh, for anti-harassment purposes, but also just because if you do end up in court, and I'm defending you, I would prefer to have a client who says, I have written records from here to here. Most people don't keep records that way, but especially in a time like this, it's good for people to try for sure. So that winds things up. Uh, this is if you are in the county of Los Angeles and you require assistance, I encourage you to contact LAFLA. Uh, we will let you know if you're eligible for our services or not, but of course, if you are, uh, they are entirely free. Um, and we do have this, on, this helpline to call into or you can apply online uh, for services. I believe that's my last. Do we have questions? Joshua, that was that was that was wonderful. We are so grateful to you. Thank you so much. If you're just joining us now, this is Equality California's third webinar in the series. Uh, the topic today is on evictions. Our speaker today is Joshua Christian. He's the uh, staff uh, attorney with the uh, Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, talking about evictions. So, Joshua, I have uh, we have a number of questions that have come in, and I wanted to ask you one from Lauren. Uh, she asked, um, does that include, so I think it was earlier in the presentation, does that include all tenants in a building that has Section 8 tenants, but they themselves are not Section 8? If you can sort of describe what that might mean and, and how that might affect someone like uh, Laurel. And then we also got a question from Gary, if you could put your contact information back on. So if you can go back one slide and just leave that one up, um, that would be best. Thank you. Great. Um, so Section 8 tenancies. So Laurel, the answer is uh, no, unfortunately, but let me explain how Section 8 tenancies work in general. There are a few different kinds of subsidized housing. A Section 8 housing choice voucher, as you've already acknowledged that you understand, but I'll go over it anyway, uh, is tied to a particular tenant, and that subsidy is only attached to that tenant's rent. If a tenant with a Section 8 housing choice voucher picks up and moves to another apartment, that subsidized rent moves to the other apartment with them. Uh, that particular tenant is going to be affected by the, the federal eviction moratorium. I do want to say, though, there is another kind of Section 8 subsidy that does apply to an entire property. There's project-based public housing. There's low-income tax credit housing. Those types of properties usually have different administrative requirements, uh, but those subsidies will apply to all of the units in a particular building or possibly to a subsection. Ultimately, the question that I would ask uh, you can check in with uh, a number of different databases online to see if your property is subsidized, but below market rent that you are paying is usually the indicator that there's some kind of subsidy on the property. Oh, uh, Valerie, I think you're, you're still muted. Quite right, I am. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box down below. Uh, Joshua and I can both see them and he can ask or answer your questions. Um, I have another question that I wanted to ask you. So if, what would be your advice to somebody who's just lost their job because of coronavirus and they know that they're not going to be able to make next month's rent? Would you advise them to call their landlord right away? Would you think it's better to call a legal aid organization? What should people do when they know that, say, today's what, July the 2nd? Maybe they, don't, they know they can't pay their August rent. Mm -hmm. So I would say contact a legal aid organization first if, if you're able to. Uh, don't break the bank paying an attorney necessarily, but if you do the research into your own ordinance, then you know how to protect your rights. In many jurisdictions, there's a housing department of some kind that's publishing information about this that can answer questions about it if you call in. Um, ultimately, I would say just from just a perspective of social niceties, uh, usually you're going to be more successful in avoiding disputes with your landlord if you work with them early. Um, but I don't, we do have, you know, a common issue of landlords coming back to tenants and saying, well, if you can't pay your rent due to coronavirus, I want to see six months of bank statements and your last, all of your last paychecks, which is unreasonable in most jurisdictions. And the advice that I usually give folks is, look, if your landlord demands documentation, um, what you feel is, can be given to them consistent with your health during the pandemic and with your privacy, I'll go ahead and give it to them and find out in your local or in your local jurisdiction 
what you're required to give or what you might not be required to give uh, and just make sure that you're that you're protecting your rights but uh, as long as you're protecting your rights and you know your rights there's no real reason not to communicate with your landlord earlier rather than later yeah that makes perfect sense so can you tell us a little bit of like what the eviction process looks like? Is it always that someone will come home from, you know, bring their kids home from school and their stuff is out on the sidewalk? Or are there other ways that, that landlords can, can evict, but it doesn't necessarily look like something maybe we've seen in the movies or uh, experienced? So that's going to be a long answer. So everybody who's submitting questions, now is the time for you to d d d phrase it however you like, draft it five times and punch it into the chat. Um, so the eviction process in California, I think where I'll start is, is um, if you are a bona fide tenant in California, which means that you've stayed in a unit for longer than 30 days, or you have a rental agreement, you've been paying rent, uh, you are entitled to a civil proceeding in court before your landlord can evict you, actually physically expel you or your property from the premises. The only, the only way that a landlord can evict you legally uh, is for a law enforcement agency, the sheriffs or the marshals, with a court order to come post a notice to vacate on your door, at which point you'll be given five days to vacate the premises. And then, only after the expiration of that period, can they remove you. Now, let me explain to you what that civil process looks like quickly, because it, it is a decent process. And if your landlord follows it properly, it will give you more notice. In the state of California, you are, a landlord is required to give you written notice before they even try to evict you in court. So the idea is that if a landlord uh, chooses to try to evict you for non-payment of rent, that landlord has to give you a three-day notice to pay rent or quit. And if you pay your rent during that three days, your landlord is obligated to accept it and cannot try to sue you, or if they do try to sue you to evict you, they'll lose as long as you keep good records of trying to pay. So uh, there is always that written notice, written notice that you breached your lease, written notice that uh, uh, essentially that your landlord intends to try to evict you. After that notice has expired, then your landlord can go to court. And when they file with the court, they actually have to attach that notice that they served and say, here's the proof, we served the notice, the notice expired, now we have gone into court. When that happens, the landlord files the summons, which remember the court is not issuing summons for most purposes now. Uh, then you answer within five court days, you have to file an answer in court. And then the eviction proceeding will move forward and, and there are kind of mechanics and you're, it'll be up to your landlord to request a trial. You, you should demand a jury trial, but the process usually takes at least several weeks at least in in the county of los angeles it's going to take at least at least a few weeks for it to move through the whole court process you can show up and defend yourself in court assuming that you answer it on time um and only after that if there is an adverse judgment against you the court finds that yes you didn't pay your rent yes you were served with that notice yes you did not pay during the notice or whatever the grounds for eviction are then the court issues a document and it goes to the sheriff and eventually the sheriff comes and issues that five day notice. So you're looking at probably if your landlord chooses to, to pursue eviction, first you have to get a written notice from your landlord in a very specific way. And then the court process is gonna take a while too. I tell people um, four to six weeks is, is a good estimate. Don't hold me to that. I can't provide legal advice in your particular case because we're not speaking individually, but that's kind of a general rule of thumb. Now let me talk about illegal evictions, uh, Valerie, because you, you said here, is, that there, is there a way to do it properly? Uh, we are running into a large and, and growing problem of landlords trying to illegally evict tenants from their units. Uh, and what that means is you leave your unit, you come back, the locks are changed. You come back, your, your belongings are on the sidewalk. Uh, we also, uh, the landlord will show up with the police department and say, this person, I don't know who this is. I've never seen this person before. They just, they're a squatter. They're a trespasser, right? The most important thing in that situation is to know your rights and to have proof that you are a tenant with you at all times. And so if you believe, if you are in a dispute with your landlord and you think you might be at risk of illegal eviction, or if you're in a dispute with your landlord at all, really, carry proof of tenancy with you, which means in an ideal world, a copy of your lease, 
have an ID to prove that you're the person on that lease. If you don't have a written lease, mail that you've received, the more official, the better, a car registration or a driver's license with that address on it. And be prepared to do two things. You explain to the police if they arrive, I am a tenant, there has not been a civil proceeding to evict me, and you require a court order in order to expel me from the premises. And also always call the watch commander at your local uh, uh, police precinct if this is a problem. Uh, in general, it should be a sheriff or a marshal that's going to be conducting the eviction proceeding. But if a law enforcement agency shows up, you should call that watch commander and explain the situation. Uh, if your landlord illegally locks you out, you should call the police. You have a legal right to be inside that apartment and to possess it. You, they, your landlord has violated the law and therefore law enforcement should come assist you to get back in. Unfortunately, a lot of that is at the discretion of law enforcement at that point. But if law enforcement refuses to help you and you have been locked out, you're gonna to wanna to contact a legal aid, legal aid organization or an attorney really fast because you can file possibly a kind of emergency proceeding in court, but that's also very difficult to do during uh, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Wow, um, that's really sobering. <laughs> <laughs> So how should people access the courts if a case is filed against them? So this is a, a, another problem. I think you're, you're referring to, to physical, physically yeah. accessing the court system. Um, That's right. We are seeing due process issues crop up during this period, and, and it remains to be seen what's going to happen with that after the fact. But uh, it, let, let me pose a hypothetical. Um, your landlord can't get a summons issued. And so they petition the court with their lawyer uh, and say, this is a public health and safety problem. My, th this, this tenant is, uh, is harassing other tenants, has threatened other tenants in the building, and there might be imminent violence in the unit. Uh, and they make a filing with the court that makes all those claims, and they send it to you the day before you need to go uh, respond to this. Um, and the, you know, the worst case scenario is the court actually initiates a case, right? How do you respond? Because many courthouses are shuttered for the purposes of most hearings. And many courthouses are saying people have to call in to, to, to appear at the courthouse. And there is often miscommunication between security staff, between clerks, between judges. And it's important to preserve, again, preserve your rights and keep records if you believe you're going to have difficulty accessing the courthouse. So first things first, there is always going to be a court clerk that you can call. Go to the court's website, find the phone number for one of the court clerks. The court clerks are generally staffing phones, although you might have difficulty getting in touch with someone, and they can explain to you how to get into the courthouse, and they can possibly set if that's necessary. Um, in addition to that, if you're unable to set up a telephonic appearance, show up to the courthouse. That's the way I say. We have clients who show up to the courthouse and get turned away by security staff. But again, you need to protect your rights by showing that you did everything you could to appear to defend yourself. And it is the court who did not permit you the opportunity to appear and present your defense as is your right. Uh, and so if you're unable to make a written filing, if you're unable to appear telephonically, and even if they're telling you, we won't let you appear in person, you need to go down to the courthouse and tell them, I am attempting to appear in person. If they're refusing to let you in, say, I need you to go check with the court clerk to make sure that you're not going to let me in. And, you know, I, I, if there's a security officer, could you please give me your name so that you, I can record that you're not letting me into the courthouse. And what that means is that you might have grounds later on to come back to the court and say, this summons never should have been issued. Uh, this default judgment never should have been entered, whatever it happens to be, be, for due process reasons, because I was never permitted to appear in court and present a defense. And oh, that's really interesting. So Joshua, just anecdotally, do you think that people who are LGBTQ, which is, you know, uh, Equality California's main focus, or people of color are more affected by uh, hostile uh, landlords? Do you find that this is... Uh, uh, obviously, you know, low income people, um, you know, are, are across the spectrum. But, you know, when we when we look at some of the, you know, most dire statistics, 
our community is is you know sort of at the bottom of every metrics um, in terms of uh, of uh, you know over policing of uh, a, a aggressive police behavior um, uh, discrimination and bias. Yeah. Uh, so 100%. I, I I think first of all, I'll caveat by saying you know we I provide services to individual clients, so I can't speak to statistical trends or anything like that. Also, uh, we receive kind of a self-selected sample of the folks that are being victimized by the worst landlords. But there there's no question, statistically speaking, that the pandemic all across the country is affecting vulnerable communities more, uh, the LGBTQ community, uh, communities of color. And that is, uh, I mean, that's partly a symptom of structural racism, of wealth disparities, of simple discrimination and animus among uh, the police community and uh, other communities that might be more engaged in property ownership. But the, the point is yes. Um, and it might also be a little bit more difficult for folks to uh, get the understanding of, of individuals like law enforcement, for instance, who they might be relying on to protect their rights. Um, I'll also say the coronavirus is sometimes a pretext for landlords to get a little bit aggressive um, when, frankly, their aggression doesn't actually have to do with not getting the rent that, that wasn't paid due to coronavirus, right? So um, I will say that's part of the reason that it is very important to know what anti-harassment uh, ordinances might be in place in your jurisdiction. So uh, some anti-harassment ordinances are specific to COVID-19. And they say, if your landlord is harassing you because you didn't pay your rent because of coronavirus, uh, there are special damages. But there are others that say, if your landlord tries to evict you, period, that's harassment during this period, they, they ought to know better, right? Um, so it's important to know your rights because you're, you, you can come back with a, a pretty serious threat of legal action in certain jurisdictions. Um, yeah, I did, did that answer your question? It did, certainly. And in fact, you know, I should have added another, you know, particularly a vulnerable community. And those are people who are living with disabilities, including HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, and I assume that there are other protections that, you know, possibly may, you know, kick in for, for um, those particularly vulnerable communities. But I should have added them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it is important to, important to you know, contact the, the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. Uh, keep in mind that uh, as a disabled individual uh, uh, and uh, as a member of a minority generally under the Fair Hous Housing Act um, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, you have certain rights against discrimination. Um, we have seen some pretty terrible uh, uh, harassment cases against landlords with disabled individuals. Uh, I won't go into specifics for confidentiality reasons, but uh, exploiting people's disabilities as a way to cause a particular threat to them to uh, vacate their apartment vo voluntarily. Um, the final resort is the city attorney. Uh, find out who is the law enforcement, the, the, the prosecutor in charge of prosecuting civil cases in your jurisdiction and contact the city attorney if, if there's a serious problem going on. Um, in addition, it is possible in many jurisdictions, courts are still open for restraining order cases. And so if there is true, you know, vicious, violent harassment going on that's threatening your health or safety, there are still mechanisms available for that. And you can get a civil harassment restraining order against an abusive landlord. Thank you for that for that sobering uh, recommendation. So in the very beginning of our of our webinar, we had a little poll that came up and asked people about you know whether they're at uh, imminent risk of uh, of eviction themselves or if they know someone. Maybe we can get the results here. I don't know, Joshua. Can you see the screen as well? It says, you know, "Are you concerned about being evicted?" Thirty percent says yes. Uh, Seventeen percent said no. And then 50% of the people who are on this um, participating in our webinar to say not to myself but to someone I know. Mm -hmm. What do you think about those statistics? Do you think that that's, uh, you know, about average? Um, is this? Uh... Uh, it's a little bit, it's hard to say. And as I, as I mentioned, it's we have a self-selecting sample of clients. If someone comes to my office, they are concerned about being evicted, period. <laughs> so it's tough to say how many people are out there and not concerned about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Clearly, this number, you know, assuming it's representative, is far more than it would be in ordinary circumstances. I mean, eviction risk is real in California right now. There's a, 
there's a study out regarding LA County specifically from uh, UCLA's Luskin Institute. Um, Gary Blasey wrote a study that says, uh, I think the number is 120,000 individuals are likely to experience uh, homelessness at some point during the next year uh, due to the coronavirus crisis. And that is accounting for the local ordinances um, that are in place. Uh, and so it, it is a very, homelessness is a very real threat, um, a very real threat to everyone right now. Um, I do, you know, I do encourage folks that I often say uh, uh, there are landlords out there who are understanding and all, everyone is in the same situation. And so if you believe that you have a relationship with your landlord that can be preserved, if you believe that you can negotiate some situation uh, where uh, communicate with your landlord, there's no need to sacrifice your legal rights. I don't want anyone going out there and signing paperwork saying, I'll pay you back the rent within six months when the law says you don't have to pay them for 12 months, right? So make sure you know your rights. At the same time, communicating with your landlord is always a, a good idea if they're gonna be a reasonable individual. Well, I don't see any other questions that have come in through our Q&A box. If anyone would like to pose last question for our amazing speaker, we've been speaking with Joshua Christian. He is the staff attorney at the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. Been incredibly helpful, as I said that at the top of the hour, that we're gonna be sending out copies of his slides and any other further information that we have that might be helpful to our community with regard to evictions and possibly you know, an imminent threat of, of homelessness. We'll be sending these things out. All of these materials and all of our web webinars remain you know, evergreen on our website, so you can always contact them. And again, you know, our COVID-19 uh, helpline um, is, is a place where you can reach out to us and ask direct questions. And some of these people obviously will be uh, referring to uh, Joshua and his, his amazing colleagues who, as he said, the top of the hour, you know, didn't only, you know, focus on evictions, but many other cases of harassment and uh, discrimination and bias. Um, I think we're going to be putting up one last uh, poll. This has to do with, you know, how helpful this, this webinar has been. Uh, in teaching yourself how to guard against eviction and some of the, the legal protections that you could avail yourself of. What well, asks me to answer? I can't do that. I'm biased. <laughs> okay, okay, no bias allowed for you, Joshua. But for everybody else, we would really appreciate it. Uh, but I hope that Joshua, you'll accept our thanks. Uh, you know, tremendous appreciation for your knowledge, for your expertise, for for really the sacrifices you've made in your career in order to help people who are really uh, in a very vulnerable position. And it's been an enormous, you know, a sobering thinking about, you know, as you said, 120,000 people are likely to experience homelessness because of, uh, because of COVID, you know. In LA County think. alone. Yep. That's the statistic is Los Angeles mm -hmm. County only. Um, yes. I do want to say also, sorry, Valerie, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Do you want to? Not at all, not at all. I okay. was just thanking you. Uh, so the, the, even if you're not, if you're in LA County, reach out to LAFLA, but I want to say to everyone, Many, many people are eligible for our services now that were not before because of their, uh, because of the impact of coronavirus. Call in, inquire. Uh, the legal services community all across California is very, very strong. Uh, you know, I've worked with attorneys in the Bay Area, in Alameda, in Sacramento. The, the, the attorneys at your local legal services organization are extremely talented. Uh, and everyone is scrambling and working really hard to, to support the community. So I really do encourage you to reach out if you're having a legal issue and inquire, um, particularly with regard to housing. Thank you again, Joshua. We appreciate it very much. Uh, our fourth webinar will probably be in the next week or two. And uh, please stay tuned to our website and we'll be contacting you in the future about our, our webinars coming up. Joshua, again, thank you. Thank you, Valerie. I appreciate it. Be well.